I'm here today with Kat Armas. Kat has a new book just about to be released for Brazos Press entitled Abuelita Faith, What Women on the Margins Teach Us About Wisdom, Persistence, and Strength. Kat has an MDiv and an MAT from Fuller Theological Seminary. She's a Cuban American writer and speaker and hosts the Protagonistas podcast, where she highlights stories of everyday women of color, including writers, pastors, church leaders, and theologians. She's written for Christianity Today, Sojourners, Relevant, Christians for Biblical Equity, Fuller Youth Institute, Fathom Magazine, and Missio Alliance. Kat also works on the Living a Better Story project at the Fuller Youth Institute and speaks regularly at conferences on race and justice. I should also say that Kat is an alum of one of our Publishing in Color conferences. So uh, Kat, thanks so much for joining us and uh, many congratulations on your new book and all that you've accomplished. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. And and yeah, it was so wonderful connecting um, as a uh, publishing in color, I guess, student. And so it's wonderful to be, um, yeah, on the other side of it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, that's the kind of thing that we like to hear is that uh, people get book deals. So uh, I'm so glad that that's <laughs> been the case for you. Yeah, so, thank um, you so much. Before we, you know, kind of dive into the new book, maybe tell us about, you know, more about your background than what I kind of touched on. Yeah, so um, I'm Cuban American. I'm originally from Miami, and that's a lot of what my book is about. Um, sort of just my social location as, as someone wrestling um, with Christianity and wrestling with faith um, from, you know, from the background of being a, a Cuban American and all of that, that, all of that, excuse me, all of that, that entails. Um, and so, yeah, so I grew up in Miami and then um, I was, you know, raised Roman Catholic and that's sort of where my spirituality was formed initially. And then um, I sort of was introduced to, to white evangelicalism um, and quickly began wrestling with that, what it means to be a Christian um, as someone who is not from the dominant culture, but, you know, obviously is within the dominant culture. Um, and, and yeah, and so that's sort of where this book, um, the idea of this book sparked uh, was during my time in seminary. Um, and, and I began asking myself, you know, uh, what, it, what does it mean to be a th theologian? What does it mean to um, be knowledgeable or have wisdom, right? And that's when I realized that, you know, the most that I learned about God was from the quote unquote uneducated, you know, women of color that surrounded me growing up. Um, so yeah, so that's a, a little bit about my background. And, and you know, like I said, I, I went to seminary and um, wrote this book, and now I'm continuing my theological education. And I, I'm still, you know, sort of wrestling with what it means to be a Christian um, in this world. So, <laughs> well, I think, you know, that's an evolving question for a lot of us. So right. You're not alone there. <laughs> yeah. Um, but tell us a little bit about, you know, some of the other things. You know, you've done a lot of different things at Fuller, you know, the Fuller uh, Youth Institute, and you have the podcast that I mentioned, the Protagonista. So can you talk a little bit about those things? Yeah. So um, I began my seminary career at a, you know, a very conservative, you know, part predominantly white evangelical uh, seminary. And then I transferred over to Fuller and um, you know, because I really wanted to find a place that was more inclusive, particularly for women at that time, um, you know, and then, of course, racially and ethnically and all of these things. So um, I got an MDiv at Fuller. I decided that I loved, you know, being a student. I loved, you know, uh, theological education, which is kind of funny because my book, um, I'm sort of saying that that's not super important, right? So <laughs> it's, a, it's a wrestling of those two things of lived experiences and how that's just as important as um, you know, formal theological education, right? So, so yeah, so I got an MDiv and then I, I, you know, I realized that I loved it. And so I continued on with an MAT. Um, and within that, you know, as I was wrestling with the ideas of this book and wrestling, um, you know, with women of color as theologians, as genuine sources of theology, those who may not be educated or those who may be on the margins. Um, I also, you know, started meeting just so many women of color um, who were doing incredible things, right? Pastoring churches and, and um, you know, writing books or whatever that they were doing. Some of them, you know, I, I was just talking to everyday women who were just doing amazing things within their, you know, their everyday life. And I thought, there's not a lot of podcasts, you know, that focus on women of color, particularly, um, and just doing amazing things in their spaces. And so I decided that I wanted to start, um, yeah, just have a couple conversations with women. The idea started with just, um, I wanted to do like a mini series, like 10 episodes. 
And people just started listening. And, you know, I, I was just meeting so many incredible women that I was like, you know what, let's just keep going. So it's been almost four years and, you know, just still um, meeting with different, you know, having conversations with different uh, women, whether they're, they be authors or, um, like I said, you know, just pastoring or just, you know, doing things that I find interesting um, that, yeah, that I think that others should learn about. Well, I know just doing all these book interviews myself, I mean, you know, talking to a variety of folks and, and learning about their work is just a wonderful thing to do. Right, right. It's very educational. It's very helpful for both. It expands, you know, your, both of your networks. I mean, it's just very uh, beneficial. Yeah. And I realized, you know, not a lot of people were hearing from, obviously, you know, um, women, whether they be women on the margins or, yeah, just women of color. A lot of people weren't um hearing from them. So I just wanted to make sure that, you know, we had a lot of access to, yeah, what everyone is, is up to. So I'd like to read a couple of the endorsements, you know, from your book. Uh, one of them is from our other author friend, Marlena Graves. Um, she says, Armas demonstrates that powerful named and unnamed women who through the quotidian have affected the outcome of history, fill not only the Bible, but our lives. Let us sit at Armas feet that we might gain the wisdom we so desperately need to embody Abuelita faith ourselves. So that's very nice. And mm -hmm. then from Mark Lamberton, who's the president of Fuller Theological Seminary, a tour de force. Armas immediately and boldly draws us to her Abuelita's magnetic and wise Cuban embrace while opening up an intimate universe of courageous, faith-filled women inside the biblical narrative and beyond. So those are both really nice uh, endorsements. Yeah, they are. <laughs> so thankful for them. Yeah. So, you know, kind of go back to the beginning of when you first thought about writing this book and, you know, how it became a book. Yeah. Um, so I was, you know, like I mentioned, I had, I was in seminary. I had, this was sort of, I was new to, you know, evangelicalism in general, um, growing up, you know, being raised Roman Catholic in Miami, I was, uh, raised spiritually in, um, an immigrant community, you know, and, um, I, like I said, that was where I learned the most about God. That was where I was shaped um, theologically. And of course, as a young kid, I didn't really know. I wasn't, you know, aware of just how deep spiritually that was. Um, but what I found so interesting was a lot of my, you know, and of course, abuelita means grandmother in Spanish. And so um, a lot of my grandmother's um, faith was um, just through lived experience. You know, my grandmother, like I mentioned earlier, wasn't educated. You know, she didn't lead Bible studies. She didn't have the, you know, quote unquote, right way to, to read a Bible passage, you know. Um, but she just provided for our family you know, she sewed for a living and she had her own little business from home. And, you know, our, like I mentioned in the book, you know, our front door was constantly swinging open with people from the neighborhood, whether coming over for food or for coffee or, you know, to try on clothes. And, um, and so I, I, you know, realize after once I got to seminary and I started learning so much about God and, and I was, you know, in a very white dominant male dominant setting and, you know, being someone who was raised in a very Cuban culture, it was, you know, it was a culture shock for me. And so as I'm learning about God, so much of it, you know, or so much of how we understood or how I was taught to understand um, faith or spirituality was very different than from how I was raised. It was very different. Um, it was very heady, right? Or very, um, we had to know, we had to get the right way to understand things. There was one way to, to be. Um, and, and so I sort of had a crisis, you know, the first year of seminary, um, because, you know, my grandmother wouldn't articulate things the same way that my seminary professors would, or my grandmother wouldn't, you know, it was just very different. Um, but I saw um, God so clearly as I reflected on her life. And then as I began to uh, study women in the Bible, and as, as I began to um, really dig into scripture, I began to realize like, wait a minute, so many of these stories of women unnamed and named, you know, women that are overlooked, many of their stories are overlooked in the Bible. I, I began to realize, wait a minute, you know, this, this is my grandmother's story. Like, for example, I mentioned that my grandma sewed for a living. That's how she provided for us. Um, and, you know, I look at, at a story like Tabitha's and Acts and, and, you know, she's in her story, she dies and, 
they call on Peter to come and resurrect her. And she's called a disciple. She's one of the few women in the Bible that are called disciple. And, you know, when, when Peter comes to resurrect her at her bedside are all the widows of the community showing the tunics that she made for them and saying, look, look, look what she made for us. And, you know, I remember reading that and thinking, wait a minute, this is my grandmother's story. You know, this is my, this is, you know, if my grandmother, you know, were in that setting, it would be similar, right? There would be people from our community at her bedside saying, look at what she made for us. And so I start wrestling with this idea, like, what if that is the work of theology, right? Um, We don't know much about Tabitha other than she sewed, right? I mean, that's like one of the main things we know about her. And so, you know, I sort of asked the question, what if that is, you know, a, a theological, you know, there's so much theological insight that we can gain from that. What if that is wisdom? What if, you know, how we, how women have used their bodies and their hands literally, you know, to create and provide, you know, what if that is genuine spirituality and genuine faith and not just what we hear in seminary or just knowing the right way to, you know, interpret a passage. So I just, you know, was wrestling with a lot of these things. And the more that I dug into scripture and the stories of these women, the more I was like, you know, this is, this is my grandmother's story, or this is a story of so many marginalized women in our society, immigrant women. Um, yeah. Women of color and other women of color. And so, yeah, so that was, um, how the, the idea sort of came about, um, just a, a, a reclaiming of my childhood faith and, um, a reclaiming of scripture, I, I would say of, of the stories of unnamed or overlooked women. Very cool. Very cool. So, um, you know, you're a first time author. And so, you know, I always like to hear stories about, you know, how first time authors get their book deal because they're generally so interesting and unique. And, and in your case, I know it involves both uh, Rochelle Gardner and Caitlin Beatty, both of whom I've worked with quite a lot uh, as, as part of you know, my program. So can you tell everyone a little bit about how that all happened? Yeah, no, thanks for asking. Um, well, I will say I um, of course, you know, I've been writing for a long time, but not necessarily anything in a quote unquote official sense. Um, and I, you know, obviously air quotes with that. Um, but I had been blogging for a long time and, and sort of just, you know, putting my thoughts out there into the world. Um, not that many people were reading them always, but uh, I just, you know, needed to write. I had a passion to just get my um you know, it was sort of like my, I call it my own self-love sort of thing, you know, um, how I put love out into the world in one of those ways. And um, yeah, so I just began tweeting and blogging and doing all these things and, and making sure that, that, you know, whatever thoughts I had made, made its way into the internet. Um, and then when I got this idea, you know, I began asking folks like, wait a minute, what do you think about this? You know, is this a good idea? Like, is this something that you, you would be interested in reading about? And so I began talking a lot about um, the idea of Awalita faith or the idea of Awalita theology. Um, you know, and I remember one moment that I thought, okay, this, you know, this could be a book and I could, you know, I really want to try and pitch this was I was actually in seminary. I was at Fuller and, um, I was in a, um, excuse me, homiletics class and I had to preach a sermon. So I actually preached a sermon on this topic in my class and, you know, it, it moved my classmates, you know, a lot of them one by one, whether it was a white man or a black woman or a Latina woman, you know, they all felt really connected to this idea of, you know, grandmother faith or, you know, a matriarchal faith, you know, whether it was they had a a grandmother or a mother or someone in their family, or they knew someone like this. And so, um, you know, I, I think that was a moment I thought, okay, a lot of people are really resonating with this. Um, so what's next? And so I just began researching, um, how to put a book proposal together. Um, and I started, you know, thinking through chapters and what would it look like? And, you know, I bought all this like writing software, which I never used, you know, but I tried to organize my life and try to, you know, try to organize this idea. Um, and then from there, I, I just pitched um, an agent. I pitched, you know, as you mentioned, Rochelle Gardner. Um, and I, I sent her a query and email and I said, Hey, I have this idea, you know, what do you think? And she responded and she said, you know, tell me more. And so I told her more and then she said, okay, send me a chapter. And then I sent her a chapter. She said, okay, send me another one. (laughs) So she was making me work for it, you know, which is great. So I said, okay. And I sent her another one. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, she decided to sign me, which was really exciting, you know, because she is a a very well-respected, um, uh, literary agent. And so I was very excited about that. And then, from there, I worked with her on um, getting a, you know, really well done book proposal and 
she was obviously very helpful with that. And then, um, yeah, she just, you know, started sending out my proposal to different publishers and I got a couple, um, offers and then I just picked one. Um, I ended up going with Brazos press. I think I, yeah, I, I enjoyed, or I liked, you know, the conversations that we had and, and I was actually excited to work with Caitlin Beatty. Um, you know, she's also a very, you know, respected, uh, author herself or writer herself. So, um, yeah, so that was sort of the journey in that. That's great. That's so wonderful. So um, as we're recording this, your book actually launches next week. So, yeah. you know, what, how's the book launch process been going for you? I mean, we're still kind of in the pandemic, you know, in terms of some yeah. limitations. So what, what, what's that look like for you? Yeah, um, it's been challenging, um, but it's been fun. I think the, the fun thing I would say is that, you know, there is so much access, you know, we do have so much access through Zoom. I mean, you know, I'm having an interview with you right now I'm over the internet. And so I think that I, you know, I'm lucky in that sense that I, I don't feel like um, my launch has been hindered in any way um, because there is so much access. Um, but yeah, you know, of course, it, there are some challenges. Um, especially now, you know, we had so much hope with the vaccine and now we're, you know, kind of worried that things aren't, aren't what we thought they would be, you know, with this new variant and all that. So, you know, of course, um, not able to do as much in-person stuff as I had hoped, but overall just the launch and um, it's busy, it's exhausting, you know, so many interviews all the time and, um, you know, a lot of self-promoting, which can be very uncomfortable at times and just, Hey, you know, pre-order my book or buy my book. Um, but it's so much fun. It's really fun when you are working on something for so many years, you know, I mean, at this point, it's been almost four years that I've been working on this and finally it's going to be released into the world. And it's almost like, Oh, you know, a breath of fur, it's not a breath of fresh air, but it's almost like a sigh of relief, you know, that it's finally out there. Um, but it's been a lot of fun uh, and it's been a lot of work and very exhausting. And I'm just looking forward to a little bit of rest afterwards. Although I did sign a two book deal. So I have a second book that I ah. have to write. <laughs> oh, well, so, that's good though. I mean, I know yeah. more work, but I was going to ask you about, you know, if you have any future writing plans, that's, yeah. that's good to hear. Yeah, no, I'm excited. Um, I, you know, and I'm also, I, so I got pregnant in the midst of all of this. And so I'm also <laughs> pregnant. And so oh, it's just, been, <laughs> and, yeah, you're, just and you're going to be starting at <laughs> Vanderbilt Divinity School. So right. you are going to be busy. Yeah. So, yeah. So it's, it's a lot, but I mean, it's honestly, of course, it's a dream of mine. You know, this is a dream realized. So I'm, I'm thankful for all of it. Oh, that's really great. Good for you. Uh, it's it's you. exciting to see, you know, you're doing so much and, and making so much progress. Thank you. Thank you. So I was going to ask you about, you know, any future books. I mean, can you say much about that at all or not? The two um, or I'm not sure. I don't think so yet. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's fine. That's fine. Because it's still very new, but, um, but yeah, so I mean, manuscripts will be due early spring. And so, yeah, I'll be hopefully talking about it more um, towards the end of fall. Well, keep us posted and, you know, we'll do. Uh, do another interview when that one comes out. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. So uh, where can people, you know, purchase the book? Yeah. So, I mean, really anywhere the books are available on my website. If you go to catarmus.com forward slash book, um, I have a ton of links there. If you want to shop thrift, if you know, if you don't want to buy from Amazon or whatever. Um, yeah. So if you want to check there, it's, it's available on a lot of different platforms. So catarmus.com. Dot com. Mm -hmm. com. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Well, Kat, thanks so much for joining us and telling us about this. And again, congratulations on uh, all of this. It's just so wonderful to hear. Yeah, thank you so much for, for the chat. And thanks so much for having me on. Sure, sure. And I really hope the book does well. Thanks, me too. <laughs>